And we're going to go quickly go through the steps when you go through the reasonable accommodation process. Real simple, to the point. We've already talked about that. You know, if the person requesting accommodation is the individual with disability, you know, they've got to come, they've got to come forward. They've got to say, hey, I want this accommodation, whatever that may be. But they've got to get a documentation so you can comfortably say, as a manager, I can accept or deny. Even if you have to may get uh, a medical, uh, maybe an agency medical person to take a look at it and help you with the determination. Again, that kind of stepped into step two. We already talked about, we made it very clear. What do you need to do to make that uh, decision? Also, working with your your HR office. In the in the case here, they used a qualified person with disability. Well, EEOC has kind of dropped that now based on some new regs where the new uh, amendment to the ADA Act, pretty much anything is considered um, an illness or whatever. So we used to have some outlined specific items, the type of illnesses or conditions or whatever. Now it's um, it's pretty wide open now of what it can be. So now we shouldn't be so concerned about what type of illness it is versus do they really have it or not. And then the essential functions of the duties. Can with some type of accommodation can they still perform the function of the duty? This is unfortunate where if somebody happens to be in an automobile accident and is paralyzed now, they are this uh, uh, engineering tech that go out and do land survey or a survey a tech where they're supposed to go out and doing surveys on uncharted land, crawling through brush and going up 70 degree slopes, 60 degree slopes or whatever, can they do the job anymore? So what's the essential a job is essential is going out and doing those surveys and taking those notes or whatever or sitting at the desk. So there might be a change there. So there might be reason to do accommodation or something. We talk about determining whether preferred accommodation is reasonable or not. Whether it's a person, we'll use the example of the, the person actually in the wheelchair where their office is on the second floor and you have to be in a building that has no st elevator. What's, what's reasonable? Is it reasonable to build an office downstairs, put a ramp in? I think that might be reasonable. Now, is it reasonable to put an elevator in, especially if it's a historic building? They may not be reasonable. So what's some alternatives? Again, that's what you work in and, and what they're requesting. Is it reasonable to do or not? And again, just because a person, for example, there's a um, device, if it's a visual issue, look at the monitor, the computer screen. If you give me this $5,000 device, I'll be able to work efficiently. Well. Yeah, we see that that may be the device itself may be reasonable, but but if you can find something for twenty five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to do the exact same thing, no problem with doing that. It's all right to be driving the Benz, but if uh, Chevrolet Colt will do, well then we'll get the Colt. It's still gonna get you there where you want to go. So it's okay to say no. We'll we'll work with you on this one, but this is what we're gonna get, and especially when there's resources out there that you could probably get it for little or no cost. The thing that makes it clear is when you say that. Right off the bat, that money is an issue, funding is an issue, you can't say that. You can't automatically make a decision based on funding. Because part of the philosophy is, or I guess the rationale behind it is, you're part of a big federal agency, so technically you should have money to, to make some reasonable accommodation. But again, and we're talking $2,000 versus $60,000. So, what's reasonable? Also, determine, and if you do that accommodation, if you choose to do that, or if the decision is to, we will accommodate the person, at, at the period of time, is the accommodation working or not? Or is that accommodation you set upon might be okay? It's working, no far, no problem. We can keep going. We can go and do it. Versus, hey, we tried it six months and it's just not working. Maybe we need to do something else. That person oh, who's in the wheelchair, we got them accommodated downstairs. Maybe some other medical conditions come up where now they can't work in the office on X amount of days a, a week. Maybe because of whatever. Okay, can you modify it? We can do some work at home, which has been office all the time. Or is it getting where the person's condition, they were worse than we thought, where maybe they, they can only work half time? What do we do there? Do we, we need a full time person there? What do we do? Can we hire another full time, a half time person to benef benefit that or whatever? And this is where sometimes it gets real tough. Because sometimes you got to make a decision where, even through no fault of their own, you might have to make the decision that it's not working. Even though that person may adamantly agree that, hey, I'm getting it done, you're not giving me a chance. And I think here is where, again, we talk about decisions that are made. We're talking about decisions that are made where, again, this person's been a viable employee, you know, great performer, but unfortunately because of some accidents, illness, or whatever, 
Now they can't perform the job they've been able to perform. We can't find accommodation. We don't have, X, you know, we're a small park or a small unit. We don't have you know, X number of jobs we can pay somebody in. Then you may have to make those decisions. And that gets into the six where it's not working. And then sometimes we got to make adjustments. Can we, can we move the person to the position? Can we retrain them, whatever? And there's times when the decision might be you have to remove them from their position. You, know, you might have to do that and it'd be an involuntary removal. They didn't do anything wrong. But unfortunately, this is not the days 30 years ago where I don't know how it is with the Park Service 30 years ago, but at least with Forest Service when I was with them, you know, you had large budgets. You had buku number of jobs where you could place somebody in and, you know, and be honest with you. Something they could find, something to do to continue their employment. But this day and age, the luxury's not there. And you may have to do an involuntary removal. And I think then, again, when we talk about the complaint process and discrimination complaint, you shouldn't be surprised if you do an involuntary removal that person filed a complaint. Right. You shouldn't be surprised. As a matter of fact, you should be understanding. Why are you doing it? Because remember, when you talk about, what do you say? I think losing a, losing a job is one of the top three life-affecting changes when divorce or death or whatever. So you shouldn't be surprised about that. All you can do is, again, it's business, not personal. You know, you do everything you can and, and, and that's it. And you got to work through it. And hopefully you can find something that uh, you can work with it. But if not, you work with HR working with your yield staff or your reasonable accommodation person all through the process. Because when it comes back, they're going to look at those things. EEOC, the judge, whoever's going to look at what's the, what's the process? How engaged were you? How reasonable were you? You need to make sure you, you lead that pattern up. And it's, not, and it's not a thing of protecting yourself against the plane. It's just doing the right thing anyway. We want to do that anyway. For an employer, employer that's been productive, whatever, what can we do to, to make sure that person continues to enjoy employment?